Barry has gone very uh, British, like very royal with our new intro. <laughs> Maybe it's for our new guest, the great one, Mark Salter. Mark, thank you for being with us. Good to be here, Tim. How are you? I'm just so excited. They were gonna, they were gonna stick me with Bill Crystal or Mike Murphy or something, and I was <laughs> like, "Can we please have Salter this week? We just, we need your, we need your passion and your rage, and uh, and we need to talk about our old friend, Senator John McCain. For people who don't know, Mark Salter was uh, John McCain's longtime speechwriter, uh, co-author of of, of uh, many of, or maybe all of John McCain's books. He has a memoir coming out called The Luckiest Man. He looks, does he look like the luckiest man? I don't know, maybe. Uh, I, I'm not referring to myself in that title. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's finish important. it for a second. You've got this book. It's coming out in a month. Let's talk about it before we get to business. Luckiest man, what is it? Well, it's mostly a, a sort of a hybrid memoir biography of, of Senator McCain. Uh, I knew him, as you said, for I've worked for him for 30 years. Uh, it, uh, I tell his whole story, but I try to tell it through the comments and things he told me about his family history and his time in the Navy and his time in Vietnam. But, you know, then the bulk of the book is about my own experiences working, observing him while, when I worked for him. Well, I'm, I'm super excited. It comes out in a month. About a month. Yeah, a little, a little more than a month. Everybody should keep their eye out for that. Well, what, while Mark is here with us is in addition to being an author and being a recluse on the coast of Maine, um, away from the Navy bubble. Maybe. So many um, degrees, breezes blowing, the ocean's right there. It's also 75 in Oakland here, Mark. So, you know, we're rubbing it in on everybody. Um, why he's here is he he organized uh, and I believe called himself the administrative assistant for a new group called, uh, or a, a new collective maybe called uh, McCain Alums for Biden. Yeah. Um, and and tell, tell us about that, What why you did it, what kind of response you got and, um, you know, the whole deal. Well, the, the administrative assistant title, or AA, as it used to be called, wasn't really my position with this group. That's that's that was my business card when I worked in, the, in McCain Senate office. That, that's what chiefs of staff used to call themselves before we inflated our titles. And, you know, and uh, now they're required to be called chief. Right. Um, it was uh, you know just a few of us were talking. We knew there was a lot of sentiment in the McCain world uh, that uh, Trump uh, was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that it was imperative we get Trump out of the White House. Um, Chris, Christian Ferry, uh, Nikki Kristoff, and Joe Donahue and I sort of split up a staff list of people who worked on the campaigns, and uh, including yourself. And uh, um, we'll get to that. I've got a personal anecdote on this. I'm going to save to the end. Everybody's yeah, got to yeah, wait. I've got, I've got one that'll trump it. But, okay, uh, great. Um, but uh, uh, so. We, we did sort of divide up a list of campaign and Senate staff and Arizona staff list. And we, we you know, emailed or called around and you know, uh, found out, you know, I think we probably, you know, I think we probably operating a universe of about 400 people. And we got about 125 or 130 and, and another 150 said, I wish I could, but, you know, I, I, I you know, work restrictions or whatever wouldn't allow them to. What, what is it about that? I mean, do you think that says something about, about, McCain, the types of people that were drawn to him, or, or does it just say something about how grotesque our president is? A little bit from both columns. A little bit from both columns, I think. But um, you know, I mean, you you uh, to have worked around McCain for any length of time, um, you know, you sort of, uh, you know, you you sort of see you know the things we sort of spout is truisms, but you know, we're finding out you know a lot of people didn't really mean it. That you know, character is everything. You know, especially in a president, but in any national leader, you know, character is destiny. And, uh, um, you know, I, I don't think we've had a lower character, you know, man of lower character in the White House. I, I can't imagine, maybe, you know, um, but but not, not, not in my lifetime. Um, you know, there are lots of reasons, you know, the way he sees the world, you know, as opposed to the way McCain saw the world, you know, that the United States could do great good in the world and that we had an obligation to, to promote our values in the world. And he's antithetical to our values. But um, um, so, you know, and, you know, and he's just, um, I mean, his inept, it's, it's hard to find an adjective adequate to the chore of describing his lack of leadership in the worst public health crisis in a century um, and what that's done to our economy um, and is, you know, his, his, I mean, it's, a, you know, it's a, varies from 
blame shifting to, you know, his chronic dishonesty, all the problems that you, know, you find fault with Trump. You know, I think, you know. It's- oh, so help me understand something, Mark. I've, I was talking about this on another podcast this week and, and we put out a video last week. If you guys didn't see it, you can you can search for it on our YouTube page that, that was basically McCain's words from his 08 convention right. yeah. and a big which which I'm sure you drafted and worked with him on. And a, and a big theme of this was it was unity sacrifice to the country. Right. right? And, and he gives this he goes off about President Obama. You know, and and just kind of has a moment of graciousness for the yeah. first black nominee, uh, mm-hmm. and talks about how the fact that they are fellow Americans, and and that is uh, I forget the exact phrase, but that is something that means more to him, yeah. you know, than anything. Um, and you see this huge response. It wasn't just like a you know sometimes you give a line and everybody's kind of like the the crowd is cheering because this mm-hmm. was all part of who McCain was. This whole stadium is erupting, and you got to think that many of those same people are now you know, in the stadium cheering when, when Donald Trump exposes, espouses the opposite of that. Well, I, I, I hope not too many of them, but uh, yeah, you know, there've been a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of people who've disappointed so, over the last three and a half years, four years. Um, you know, the, the idea uh, that line that he's, that shared association means more to me than any other, that, that trait means more to me than any other association. He's, he's re- repeated that line for years and years and years. And I think, I'm pretty sure it was in his final farewell statement that he had, uh, that he and I worked on uh, shortly before he passed away. Um, that did matter to him. And he always did see Americans as you know, having many more things in common and shared responsibilities that were much more numerous and important than our disagreements. Uh, he always believed that. Trump is the opposite of that. Um, his his whole MO is divide, divide, divide. You know, um, he'll, he'll sh- he'd shatter us into tiny little fragments if he could. Um, and, you know, it's another reason why I think, you know, I mean, I understand uh, party loyalty and we're not we're not uh, we're not saying, you know, defeat all Republican candidates or anything. That's just get rid of this menace. This guy who's who's, you know, you know, uh, you know sort of destroying our reputation in the world, you know, uh, besmirching our values, uh, uh, sh- shit canning them, really. I mean, you're a sucker if you believe this stuff, you know, Uh I, I want to get to that sucker thing in a second, but I, I just this I wasn't going to ask this, but this has just come to me hearing you talk, and I wonder, I, you know, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I, my I was inspired by those things that that Senator McCain would talk about about kind of the America I, the American idea and what, what it was, what this country stood for, and and what that about that shared association. But I, I don't know. Over the last three years, like it, just watching this this complete menace, as you say, just trounce on all of that in the, yeah. in, in the White House and be and be an exact opposition to all of it, to all of yeah. these things that we thought we believed. I wonder, did you ever talk to Senator McCain about that? I mean, you know, he, you know, in those two years between his inauguration and when he passed and like whether it gave him at all yeah. any doubts about that or whether it changed yeah, well, his he, yeah, he spoke up quite, you know, um, I mean, he usually did it to, you know, some you know, in response to some act or statement by Trump, say the Helsinki summit with Putin, you know, one of the last public statements he issued was re- re- really tough, you know. Um, um, but, you know, he, he, you know, he, he, he did have a great deal of regard for, for General Mattis and General Kelly and General McMaster and felt that on national security matters, Trump's instincts and beliefs, you know, were atrocious and, you know, uh, he would get us in a lot of trouble, but as he would, he always reassured me, as long as they're there, it won't get out of control, you know? Well, they're not there. They're gone. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, well, what about the sense that he's just like tarnished, you know, these things that we held dear maybe permanently? Yeah, he didn't tarnish the values themselves. They still mean something. It's, you know, and I think it's, you know, Trump, Trump's inability to comprehend sacrifice for, something other than self-interest. I mean, you can't, there isn't anything other than self-interest for Trump. There's nothing else exists. He can't comprehend a value. It has no no meaning for it. But, you know, you, somebody like McCain or Kelly or Mattis, they sacrificed for those things. You don't, you're not, you don't get tortured for, you know, several years and live in solitary confinement and refuse to come home ahead of your friends just for a, a collection of tribes or a, a, a bit of geography, you know, it's, right. the, the country has to mean something more to you than that. The country doesn't mean anything to Donald Trump. It's just the place where he grifts. That's it. You know, it's just his address. 
It doesn't have any, uh, there isn't, a, there isn't an, uh, you know, America doesn't have any ideals in his mind. He can't comprehend them. It's not like you might as well ask him to give a lecture on, you know, particle physics. He doesn't, you know, it's, you know, it's just, it, it's not something. And the, the anecdote that just stands out to you and the McCain stuff, uh, look, we all, there's this kind of discussion going around about, is this, were these statements true? Were they direct quotes? I mean, he yeah. said these things publicly. We all saw with our own eyes, the flags, you know, they went to half staff in some buildings and not in others. You know, Miles Taylor is in a video for us that he got a call from the White House. I mean, this is obviously true. Yeah, I think all the uh, the flag stuff and all stuff, I'm not the least bit surprised Trump said all that. Uh, um, you know, and Trump. standing next to Kelly at the Arl in Arlington. I mean, yeah. that was the one that lost and yeah. was forgot to me. I mean, that just showed, like, just, like, not even, uh, he can't even comprehend the personal side of this man that he's standing next to. No, it's no. And so not, none of it surprised me. Jeff Goldberg, too, I'd um, say a kind word about it. He's a... Very, very good reporter. He has a reputation for being scrupulously fair and quite honest. You know, he's, you know, could some of his sources have made it up? I suppose, but he's probably pretty, I think he's a very discerning reporter too and knows when he's being spun. But uh, have you uh, heard from anybody over the last day that like felt bad they weren't on the list that want to get, that wants to get on now? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, there, there were, there were people that got on after it, after, uh, after it was uh, um, released, um, including my wife who I've, I sort of got a Trump your story who worked for him for 12 years. And as I'm calling people and emailing people and trying to get people on this list, I completely forgot about her sitting in the next room. <laughs> and she, she only made the list after publication, but uh, she's been. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let that stay between you and her. No, that isn't what I was going to say. I was going to save it to the end, but I'll, I'll just do it now before, because then I want to get into politics with you. Uh, it's funny. I don't, I don't, you might remember this or might not, but so in the McCain 08 campaign, he, um, uh, uh, you know, we were running out of money and there was a campaign manager change. And the guy that was in there that was a the campaign manager was the guy that hired me for all my jobs before. And a bunch of people were volunteering to leave with yeah. them. It's sort of a, if they're going to change, we need a change of heart. I was a kid. I didn't know any, I was yeah. 24. I didn't know anything. And and we were all going to announce it that morning. And and you called me. It's like 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m. in Iowa. I get woken up. I was hungover. I finally thought I was out of this campaign that was in the tank at that point. But I loved Senator McCain. I loved him. But I thought, okay, this is my ticket out. And you were like, stay. You said to me, Tim, you should stay. And and you, you espoused all the things that Senator McCain stood for. And you espoused the fact that he's a guy that's going to fight and he's, and I should fight with him. And, and you, and, and the campaign, just because it was running out of money, isn't going to run out of soul and isn't going to run out of fight. And, and, and you convinced me basically, I, 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 I switched my mind eight times that day and, and, and as a young person kind of got pressured by this notion that I should be loyal to the people that hired me, which was so stupid because most of those people are for Trump now and screw them. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, looking back on it, I just in front of everybody here, I want to say this is probably my top career regret that I didn't listen to you that morning. And, yeah. uh, and I think that it was, I think it was really was a reflection of the fact that the, that the McCain group, the McCain family, which I didn't recognize too, I, well enough as a young person, you know, really it was, it did transcend politics. And there were people there that were willing to fight about values and principles that are above politics. Yeah. Well, thanks for sticking around. Um, not, not, not everybody did, but, um, um, you know, he, he, um, he fought his way back from, uh, being, I remember Charlie Cook, who I'm like and respect very much, but pronounced him a corpse, you know, the medical examiner had been called, <laughs> he's a, um, um, patient who was dead on arrival, you know, and I don't think McCain believed he would win at that point. I, you know, I, few people did, um, but he was determined to make his point. And at that point um, in the campaign, it was about Iraq and the Syria, right. which was the most contested issue of the of that moment, you know, and he felt strongly about it and said, I'll use this as a way to defend this surge. We have to do this. And he had that formulation, which I didn't write for him. He came, I'd rather lose a campaign than a war. And uh, it mattered to him. So he stuck it out. And we went to New Hampshire that weekend. And I think every, every Bigfoot reporter and Washington was there and, uh, and McCain called him like crows on a wire, you know, <laughs> and waiting to see if he was going to you know, pull out. And, uh, um, and he, he gave, uh, he gave a, a somewhat pedestrian speech on Iraq instead, yeah. you know, which, which confused them. And, uh, um, and then we went to, uh, 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 American Legion hall or VA somewhere, I think Claremont 
New Hampshire, and he, 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 he gave a little talk there and took questions. And then he started talking to groups as small as a dozen people again. It's like we were starting all over in 1999 in New Hampshire. And uh, I remember one group was in somebody's one, – one visit was in someone's garage. <laughs> but, he, you know, he, he crawled his way back in through sheer grit. Yeah, well, I, so you missed that. I, I didn't have the grit. I, I, was, I went out with the storm. and I, I regret it. I, I'm jealous of you thinking about hearing those stories. I wish I was there with you. But, um, you know, uh, life mistakes. One, thing, one more thing I will reminisce about this. It wasn't just the Iraq surge, by the way. In yeah. that campaign, he's not, he, he had his immigration reform bill, McCain-Kennedy. That was about as popular as hemorrhoids in Iowa. Yeah, and I right. remember we went to a town hall in Council Bluffs, yeah. and 11 straight questions, 11, were about, were about the illegals and yeah. about the border and why he wasn't tough enough on that. And he stood his ground throughout that campaign. And the other thing is, I was always with him on that, but I, I, was, I had kind of bought into the advanced interrogation stuff uh, uh, in the Bush administration. And just working for him and traveling with him, he changed my mind. And then what he talked about about that issue, about torture, was about how this isn't who we are. Yeah, This isn't who we are. And I think that's been the part of the Trump thing that has just gotten – into me so much when people say i have tds i'm like maybe i do have tds because i it makes me feel like maybe it was who we are actually yeah, well i hope not um but no he was you know that that um you know to, to, it's sort of my two favorite parts of his um, political legacy i guess was that the torture debate uh, which he not single-handedly uh at, at all but but for him um, I think I don't think those policies would have ch been changed when they were changed. Um, and then the, the normalization relations with Vietnam again. What, what was in it for him? You know, his reputation early on in his career was really his reputation as a former prisoner of war in Vietnam, and uh, um, you know, he had lots of lots of uh, uh, popularity in the veterans community in that. And there wasn't anything in that for him either. He just thought it was in the best interest of the country that we move on and. Uh, those are the things I'm proudest of and the kind of things he did, which are you're inconceivable that Donald Trump would do. And why, what, what's in it for him? Exactly. You know, why, why would I do that? Sucker. Yeah. Um, well, look, I have a couple, a couple people asking who the hell are we um, who, who stumbled on this live feed. I'm Tim Miller. I'm the political director for Republican Voters Against Trump. This is the great Mark Salter. He is John McCain's alter ego, speech writer, administrative aide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to talk about Arizona. Yeah. Let's talk politically. I mean, Arizona could be it. Right. I mean, uh, you know, Arizona is, is, is uh, along with Wisconsin, are the two that look like the most tipping point states. You know, can this McCain alum thing have a difference in Arizona? Do you, are you guys hearing from people in Arizona? For sure. Uh, any, yeah. Any thoughts on how we can leverage this or how maybe people watching in Arizona can help leverage this McCain group and legacy to help Joe Biden? Yeah, I, it, sure. Uh, Arizona, I think, is uh, obviously a, a battleground state and important. I think. Right now, I, 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 uh, I, 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 because of the whole question of mail-in ballots and how, how long it may take to declare a winner, I'm, I'm hoping that Florida comes in for Biden because they start counting mail-in ballots as soon as they get them. Um, and we can put this thing to rest in a normal uh, time frame. But uh, in Arizona, sure, we're, we're all talking to local media out there and uh, we all using our social media accounts. And we'll do whatever the Biden campaign thinks would be useful out there. I'm sure we're all happy to help. Um, he's, um, you know, Arizona's changing. Uh, that's been apparent for a while. Trump didn't win it um, by much. I'm three and a half or something like that the last time. Um, a Democrat was elected to the Senate uh, first time since Dennis D. Consini. Um so It's it been a while, and I think um, Martha McSally looks like she's going to lose. Um, the last, sure. you know, the polling looks terrible for. Her. Um, uh, um, so it's changing. Uh, Sixty percent people don't really understand this. Who who are screaming in Arizona and parts of Arizona, including lots of Republicans. Uh, about uh, immigration, 60% uh, of public high school seniors in Arizona today are Hispanic. Um, it's, you know, I mean, you can only beat that drum for so many months before, you know, it, you, you, you run out of town. And, uh, um, you know, it's just... You know, uh, they're, you know, yeah. Well, if you're in Arizona, you're watching this, want to help, please send us a video for our vet and talk about John McCain. I mean, we hear from people who submit these videos that say, I was a McCain Republican and I've been so turned off. And those videos we post on Facebook, and that helps, you know, give people the courage 
who also share this view, who are sick of this, and to help nudge them in the right direction. Arizona could be key. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Who in the Republican Party is left to carry John McCain's torch, Mark? I don't have a good answer to that, so maybe you do. Um, gosh. Um, yeah, he was such a unique individual. I'm not sure anybody could do it. He had such a, um, some people would say, reckless or careless way about not not really uh, minding uh, rubbing rubbing people the wrong way if he had to, yeah. uh, he would stand up and, you know, I mean, you know, it's uh, not easily. I mean, everybody thinks, he, you know, uh, well, it, some people say, his liberal critics would say, oh, he voted with ex Republican George or whomever 95% of the time, you know, um, 95% of the votes are largely inconsequential. It's not a surprise, but, uh, um, um, but he's, he, he, you know, he didn't mind. He didn't do it easily, say, when he voted against uh, the skinny repeal of Obamacare. Um, right. That wasn't an easy vote for him. It was hard. And, you know, he didn't he didn't like to upset his, everybody's caucus. But when it was a matter he thought of, you know, serious national interest, he did. I think, you know, there are people who could be him in there. Um, uh, one guy who obviously I'm, I'm a big admirer of, even though it, in 2008 or 2007, uh, you know, in the, in the heat of a campaign, I might have said something uncharitable about, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big admirer of, of Senator Romney's, you know, who... who We're all, we all had to do our apology tour on our yeah. Senator Romney. Yeah, yeah. He's proven a lot of us wrong from that campaign, for sure. Very He's admirable. amazing. Very admirable patriot. Um, this is from Jennifer. You can feel free to tell us to pound sand on this question um, if you want, but um, it's in, in line with your with with what you're saying. Jim McCain wasn't afraid to speak his mind. A any sense for where what he'd be doing right now, where his head would be? You know, and when I, I, I get asked that question a lot. Well, what would McCain say about this? And I try not to project him too far. I just try to I just direct people to the record. Say I got asked that question a lot during during impeachment. Impeachment. I can't say what he, how he would have voted. I'm not going to do that. But I can't say he's like, you know, like the, one of the last great causes of his life was Ukrainian independence, you know, and uh, he was in the Maidan with Chris Murphy and gave a speech and he talked about it rapturously, you know, and it was, uh, um, he was very close to our ambassador there who was, you know, callously treated by this administration uh, and, uh, um, and I'm, I'm reasonably sure he would have been enraged uh, by what the president tried to get the Ukrainians to do. So you can draw your own conclusion from, from the things you know John McCain felt and said, you know, um, uh, it's, um, you know, his, uh, nothing seemed to bother him more about Trump than Trump's odd, not odd, I guess if you, We've had four years to really take a good look at his dysfunctional brain. Um, you know, was 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 tr Trump's sycophancy to Putin? Um, nothing, nothing really got him more upset than that. And it was obviously the Russia. I mean, we could spend all day on Ukraine. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the other obvious question everybody asks you, but that everybody wants to know, which is, I'm going to read something here. At the heart of Donald Trump's statement about Senator McCain is a lack of respect for those who have served and a disqualifying characteristic to be president. Was Lindsey Graham in 2015? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what the fuck? I don't know. Uh, you know <laughs> I've, I've known Lindsey for 20 years. Um, I try to refrain. Once in a while, I, I, I haven't been able to, but I try to refrain from... Uh, well, let me just put it in a different way then. Lindsay has this view. He was on, he did a Snapchat interview with my friend Peter Hamby mm -hmm. the other day where he was asked about this. And, and his basically answer is I won or Trump won, I lost. And now the best thing to do is to work with the president. And I feel like there's this divide. And I don't know if you experienced this talking to other McCain alums between me who feel like if you think that somebody is disqualified from being the president because of their traits, then just because they won in the electoral college does not change the fact that their essential traits are disqualifying, right? And then there's another group of people that are like, well, the voters, you know, he won, so now we just gotta, now we just gotta deal with it. Yeah. Uh, where, like, how, you know, is how does that that I'm that a, those I'm things a, fall? I'm a, I'm a 
I'm not persuaded by the argument, obviously. I'm a, not even persuaded by the argument I'm about maybe a little bit more, but not a lot. That, you know, I'm trying to make Trump five percent less awful. I get I get that motivation. You know, it, whether it's genuine or not, it's uh, you know I, I I can't I can't say, but I get that motivation from people, and there are people I think who are trying to. You know, uh, stop him from doing his worst. Um, they're not very successful, but because uh, um, I think we get pretty close to Donald Trump's worst with everything. The, the problem with that argument, though, Mark, I know we're, I'm preaching to the choir here, but like it runs up against the the issue of okay, but you want him to be there for four more years now. Yeah, no, I know. you know, like it's another it's another thing to say, okay, well, we got to contain right. him while he's in there, but like you know, you had a chance to impeach him. You didn't do it. You had a chance to primary him. You didn't do it. You have a chance to support a reasonable guy like Joe Biden. You didn't do it. Yeah. So like, right. what are you containing? Nothing. No. Um, no, you're not. I mean, obviously, I think he's a menace and uh, a grave and a clear and present danger is the Cold War formulation used to go. And, uh, and we can't get him out of there soon enough. Um you know, I used to say, and, and I guess I still believe it, that if you can see Trump plainly, if you see him, if you're not, if you get your information from more than Russian trolls on Facebook, you know, if you've got a discerning intellect of any kind, and I don't mean, you know, genius level, just, you know, you can tell somebody, you know, when somebody knows the difference between right and wrong and when they don't, you know, I mean, if you, if you can see him plainly, you know, and and you don't see that he's unfit for the office he's holding, then there's something wrong with you. You know, it's just that yeah, you, know, you you know you you you've got to you know take a look at your own conscience. Well, and that's the other thing about these guys in there. I said this yesterday on Twitter. It's like, and I, I wonder what your take is on this. I, I, when I read that story, the Goldberg story, I frankly got more mad at the people who are inside than him than trump i mean this is trump it's just trump we all everybody knew he was this like that's why the whole rigmarole about whether he said this exact quote or not is stupid because the the, the, he says stuff like that all the time yeah he says stuff like that all the time so my question is these people that are protecting him that's what gets me mad i I get i I have respect for madness too and all these guys but it's like what like isn't it time now in an election for these people inside to be saying, he actually did say this about John McCain. He actually did not want to put the flag at half staff at John McCain. That's just, John, that's just Donald Trump. You can vote for him if you want. You can, if you, maybe you want somebody who's an asshole to John McCain as the president. That's fine. But like, that's just the truth. Yeah, It's right. bothering me how many people in there refuse to just say that. Yeah, you're right. It bothers me too. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that was more of an event than a question, I guess. Okay, I want to. Cindy did this awesome video for the convention, where you know she talked about their relationship. Do you have anything on that? Any memories or any Biden uh, McCain oh, memories? No, yeah, they always got along. I mean, they fought hammer and tong a lot. You know, um, um, I remember once they both. I don't know how they managed to do it. They both ended up in the same place on Bosnia. But I can remember one, I think they were on Meet the Press or something. They were just beating the shit out of each other over it. You know, I thought, I just love to fight. You know, <laughs> because they, they, you know, they eventually you know, voted the same way on it. Um, um, but uh, um, he was very fond of them. He used to have this joke. Um, because McCain was the Navy liaison to the Senate in the 1970s when Biden was a very young senator and uh, on the Foreign Relations Committee. And one of the jobs, if anybody that's ever worked on the Hill knows, for the uh, uh, service liaison officers who are working in the Senate is that they all accompany uh, Senate delegations overseas, you know, and, uh, you know, make to take care of the security, logistics, yeah. make, you know, and, uh, you know, and McCain had this line. I used to have to carry Biden's bags, and I've resented it ever since. You know, <clears throat> but they were uh, as much as they, you know, uh, m- much as they argued about stuff. They're real fondness. They were actually good friends when McCain was still in the Navy, and uh, I think it was actually Jill Biden who encouraged uh, John to um, go introduce himself to Cindy McCain, and then Cindy Hensley. Uh, oh, really? Or Hawaiian, I think, in uh, in uh, Honolulu, but. Uh, um, I, I think it was it was it was during a Codell, and I think it was Jill Biden said, "Go talk to her." Yeah. What do you say to our our former colleagues and pals that are like, you know, Trump's terrible. I hate the tweets, but but this Joe Biden. I mean, Joe and Joe Biden might be okay, but 
but I mean, it's it's really Elon Omar that's going to be running the show over there, and like Joe Biden is just this far left radical, and and Gates said that Biden's been wrong about everything. Like, what what what's your response when you get that? <laughs> I think Senator Biden's been wrong on a few foreign policy issues myself, but not not everything. <laughs> and and, and by, hey, by the way, who has Churchill compared to Donald Trump? Yeah. Know? And uh, 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 you know, I don't. He's not. He's not temperamentally, philosophically, ideologically, or politically inclined to let the, the fringe of his party dictate to him uh, uh, any more than John McCain would have been dictated to by the fringe of our party. Um, so I don't have any worries about that. I'm sure just just like the Freedom Caucus can be a nuisance. Um, I'm sure some, some, you know, he'll he'll have moments with with the with the uh, woke caucus. But uh, um, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, he's a good center left, reliable guy who's got relationships in the world, values, American values, believes the our alliances are important to our own security and to the, you know, uh, the, the development, the political development and economic development of the, of, of all mankind. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the Trump is so far beyond the pale, you know, I mean, so he, none, he, he'll have none of it. There will not be a NATO. A NATO would not survive another Trump term. I have no doubt about it. It won't, you know, there'll be a European union, union defense, organization of some kind, but we won't be a part of it. And uh, and that's a, when, when the world decides they can live without American leadership, that's a bad day for Americans and a bad day for the world. And with Trump, it's all going to fall apart. Uh, and so if you care at all about the security of this country, and you care at all about the rights of human beings to live freely, not to be oppressed, to have equal justice under the law, you know, then you, you can't, you, you can't, you can't vote for this guy. Um, I agree with that. I, I have a follow up about the people who are going to be oppressed. And then I've got a, a rapid fire, two or three quick personal questions. Then we'll finish. If you have any questions for Mark Salter, uh, mm -hmm. John McCain's longtime speechwriter, shoot him over to me. Um, we're, we're, we got a few more minutes left here. This, I think it was you that wrote in an op-ed after McCain died about this influence that he had over people throughout the globe, oh, regular yeah. people, yeah. right? Who, who were who wanted to believe that they had a chance for freedom yeah. in their country and that this was just a central part of him. And that, and that now today, like basically it's, it's in Republican circles, it's, it's fashionable to, to actually say that this doesn't even, that this doesn't even matter, like that they're all on their own. Right. Yeah. That, that, that it was stupid for us to even try. So yeah. I don't know, maybe you have an anecdote about that. Yeah, well, he's um, yeah, I've got lots of them. Um, one that always kind of chokes me up because it involves my kid. But uh, uh, my, I had a daughter who was in the Peace Corps to, until recently, and she served in a rural village in Cambodia for two years, and she taught in a in a little, little village school there. And one of her Cambodian counterparts, they were having lunch, and he was complaining about his government, the Hun Sen government, who's very dictatorial government and uh, saying, you know, it's bad and we need freedom here and, uh, and we don't have it and it's, it's bad, but we, you know, we've got friends in America, John McCain, John, John McCain cares about us. He, this guy had no idea my daughter had any connection to McCain. Hey, we, here's a guy in the back of beyond, <laughs> not, not only knows his name, not, not the, not the president of the United States, a United States Senator from the state of Arizona, not only knows his name, but knows he's a friend who will help him if he can. You know, that, that to me, you know, uh, that's a, wow. <clears throat> what, what, what a, what a profile that is, you know, there was a, uh, a, guy, I love that story. a guy that works for uh, Joe Lieberman tells a story about being in a Syrian refugee camp. I can't remember if it was Turkey or Jordan. But wherever it was, right, McCain and, and Lieberman were going to go go to this refugee camp. And uh, right the same day that morning, uh, Kofi Annan, who was, I think, the interlocutor or whatever, his mm -hmm. first area in the UN after he was secretary general, when it was run out of the place by the by the refugees. You know, they threw their shoes at him and, you know, shouted obscenities at him and chased him off. And so the embassy was nervous and they didn't want McCain and Lieberman going and McCain's adamant, you know, no, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And as they're approaching the camp, they can hear these crowds of refugees chanting something and they're w very worried. It's going to be another Kofi Annan incident. Instead, they, as soon as they get there, they hear what they're chanting, McCain, 
McCain, McCain. That, and, you know, there's, there's just, it's like, there's, it just makes me so, I don't know, I don't know. I just get emotional about this. It's just because I was so, it was the thing that I loved the most about working for him and, and being for him. And I was so bought in about this, about our country, that this was, that this, that America really did represent something more than our narrow interests. Yeah. And now we have this president who is the epitome of representing only his own self-interest as mm-hmm. evidenced by this Atlantic article, as evidenced by the fact that we have zero refugees. And that, you know, we had that question from Jennifer earlier, who is, carries McCain's legacy. I, who in the Senate, who in either party is carrying that legacy right now? It's, 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 there's oh, a there, 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 there are actually some Democrats, I think, are, you know, um, I'm like uh, Chris Coons, I think is a wonderful guy. He's and, great, sure. Great guys. But just this, this clear eyed commitment to the fact that America is going to be on the side of people who want freedom everywhere. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a few Sheldon White. <laughs> I'm not even a Democrat and I never will be, but, yeah. but, but, uh, uh um, I'm trying to think of all the people I just dissed by leaving them off the list. But, you know, McCain was around a long time, you yeah. know, and, and he was out, very outspoken. Um, some people, you know, say, what was the key to McCain's notoriety? So, well, no one was more outspoken, you know, and there's, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, there's a, you know, that can be an opportunity, but there's an opportunity to talk <laughs> that, you know, and not, not, in, not, 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 not everybody wants to be that way. And then, and, and, you know, uh, you know, a fair amount of the times so. it didn't really redound to his benefit, but, uh, We've got uh, just we're, we got five more minutes here. The um, uh, this is Mark Seltzer, John McCain's speechwriter. If you're just joining us, I'm Tim Miller. This is Republican Voters Against Trump uh, live stream. Uh, Greg wants to know the the last McCain book, um, uh, which was the Restless Wave, right? Yep. That's right. Uh, that did you write that? Help him write that. Any anecdotes yeah. from that? Any big takeaways? Um, well, it started out to be one kind of book, which is largely about foreign policy and those and the issues of human rights that matter to him most. Um, in the middle of it are I'd say in the first third of it, uh, he was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and it became a very different book. Yeah. And he was, it was very urgent. He was very involved in it. And, you know, even when it got hard for him to read, um, he was very, very involved. And I would have to read it aloud to him. Um, he would, you know, um, um, uh, he wanted it to be a kind of summing up of his life the things that mattered most to him and, and a farewell to his country. And uh, the whole, you know, the idea for my, my memoir, Luckiest Man, was he kept repeating from the day he was diagnosed until shortly before he passed away. You know, you'll never see anyone luckier. You'll never find anybody luckier than me. I'm the luckiest man to have been born in America and to be able to spend my life in service to this country. Look at all the things I've been able to do. You know, you'll never see anybody luckier than me. And it was in a weird sort of way because, it's, you know, you, you, you see a, not only a guy that you worked for for 30 years, but a guy who become a, a, a very close friend, uh, wasting away. Yeah. You just see him pushing, pushing, just as if he weren't sick, you know, for all the things he believed in that mattered to him right until the very end. It was, uh, you know, he's an inspiring guy, and it should come as no surprise to anybody that he was inspiring in death, too. Man, Mark, uh, that's just... That's just something. It's just kind of I'm getting a little wistful here, having to do this. Um, uh, I want to. Um, I, I've just. I have two funny personal things I want to end on. But before that, any any final, you know, kind of thoughts from the perspective of if you're somebody that's watching this, it's trying to decide, you know, where where what where we where they should be in this election, whether they should be. You know, it's just sitting it out. I mean, a lot of the people who are following us maybe still weighing Biden versus writing somebody in. What What's your final pitch? Well, the two. There's the practical one and the one that the Biden campaign is well advised to pursue. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Nope. <laughs> or a lot worse off. But the most important thing is ask yourself this, what I would ask myself. Every influential person in your life, every good, decent person who shaped your character, your parents, your grandparents, a favorite teacher, a coach, whomever, you know, you think they would advise you to vote for Donald Trump? How would they view Donald Trump? What would they say about that? Uh, Mark, this has been the worst part about this. A couple of those people I would have usually come with are for Trump now. And I'm, and it's just, you know, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like drinking a couple of whiskeys, yelling at my grandmother at Christmas. Like I've turned into that person. That's like a crazy person. But I hear you, though. I come from a, a fairly sizable family in Iowa, and they're all Republicans, and they're all pretty conservative people. And there's you know, not one of them that's voting for Donald Trump. Not, not one of them. 
Well, I'm, I'm happy for you that that's the case. Okay, uh, final funny ones. You've turned into an aggressive uh, Donald Trump reply guy on Twitter. How is that? Uh, you can follow him, Mark Salter 55. Do you ever get wrapped on the knuckles over your replies? Are they, uh, are they after a glass of wine? Or what? Talk to us about you that. You know, I, I think I've been um, counseled back when John was still alive, not by him, but by others. Like, you're complicating things. <laughs> um, it usually happens after my second scotch, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, when, when the inhibitions are. Moving. You got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. Okay. We lost John Thompson this week. You're a big Georgetown yeah. fan. Why don't they have an on campus gym yet, Mark? What is the deal? I, I, it's so depressing to go to those games now. I, I don't think the neighborhood will let them, sadly. Um, they, they used to. When I, I graduated in 1981, back in the Stone Age, and uh, uh, all the games, it was the year. I graduated the year before Pat Ewing, but they were still an up and coming program. That, yeah. In 1980, I think we got to the regionals and uh, um, and Thompson had turned the program around and we had some great players, Sleepy Floyd, John Duran. All the games were in McDonough, which yeah. seats about comfortably, and, and a COVID aid would seat about 50 people. You know? Right. <laughs> You know, we jammed 2,000 kids in there and then they would put loudspeakers in the parking lot and everybody on campus would be down there drinking beer and listening to the game on the speakers and or if they've gotten in there. And uh, it was the most exciting. Everybody did. Now you see like there's a couple hundred students. Yeah, it's horrible. You know, or something. It's, yeah, they need one. And I wish they would. But I think, I think uh, you know, th they won't get this. Home. All right, Georgetown alums out there. Well, we got to start writing. Kid. I'm a GW guy, but I just like good basketball. And I, I hated going to those games. Um, uh, that's it. So this is Mark Salter. Your book coming out is The Luckiest Man. I'm not an usual host. This is a new thing. Mark's book is The Luckiest Man. While we're pimping things, I have a Snapchat show called Not My Party Now. So if you have a teen in your life, Mark, you may have a a daughter they're probably past teen now but maybe yeah. some teens in your life tell them to watch my snapchat show okay. not my party arvat republican voters against trump send us a video please send us a video if you're a democrat and can't send us a video send us five bucks so we can show republicans videos to other republicans and 